He raced over his horse, grabbed the skill out of the saddle, started panning away. Well, old Fred was known to exaggerate a little bit and have a couple light sodas, if you know what I'm saying. And he's telling everybody he's getting $20 a day. Well, back in 1869, $20 was an ounce of gold. He was not getting an ounce a day. Maybe two or three bucks, but weren't spread like wildfire up to San Francisco. Next thing you know, we had a steamboat engine called the Orpom coming down the Pacific Ocean, docked in San Diego Harbor, and 150 prospectors jumped off the boat and flocked up here to pan the creeks. On a side note, we have 200 gold mines in this area. We are in the very east end of this five mile race right here. This is called Gold Hill back in 1870. There are 16 gold mines right here. But going from here, eight miles east down to Banner, 25 miles of the high desert Shelter Valley, there's 200 gold mines in this 25 mile stretch. Then in the early 1870s, there was two cousins from Georgia that showed up here. This is right after the Civil War. They were ex-Confederate soldiers and their names are Drew Bailey and Mike Julian. They are our town godfathers. They showed up, saw these creeks, and almost panned out and said, Hey, this gold had to come from somewhere. So they journeyed up to three miles, and on February 15, 1870, they discovered the first rock quartz ledge, or we call it a quartz outcropping. Now, they named theirs the Warrior's Rest Mine, but it turned out to be a pocket, so it does not show up on our mining chart of 200 today. So then they established a camp down here, because you got to remember there's nothing but, you know, trees and mountains. And six days later, on February 21st, there was three gentlemen from Mike Julian Drew Bay's camp chasing bear tracks up the ring right here on the other side of this mound, and they discovered the second rock quartz ledge. Now, funny but true story, one of the three gentlemen, his name was Jay Bruin Wells, he happened to be the camp preacher, and it was Sunday that day. It's like, guys, we are not looking at this rock today. We're going to keep the Sabbath day holy. So they went back to camp. They came up the next day on February 22nd, staked their claim. As they consulted their calendar, they realized February 22nd is George Washington's true birthday. To this day, it's called the George Washington Mine. Then a month after that, on March 15th, the High Peak Mine was discovered. That's the one we're going to end up in the back. We're going to do two gold mines today. Then a month after that, right here, the Eagle is on April 5th. So you had February, March, April, all early 1870s. Now, I still count Warriors Rest as number one, so that's two, three, and four of the 16 here on Gold Hill. Now, these miners worked 24 hours around the clock. They broke it up two 12-hour shifts. They had six to eight miners per shift. They went to blow over there. And then turn around this car right here. This is a one-ton ore car. In order for these miners to make a profit for every one ton they crushed up, they'd have to extract a minimum of one ounce of gold. Now, they could do five of these in a 12-hour shift. That's blasting, activate, and bring it out here. And uh, for some of you been up to that big red rock crusher on the hill right there, that was originally right here with the bolts were sticking out of the concrete. You want your rock crusher right outside the mine to process your material. If you look at the contour of the slope right here, 146 years ago, we're going straight down. This is all a canyon right here. So everything in the parking lot, every other structure, this is all the tailings that came out of this mountain. When they brought their rock out, crushed it up, extracted their gold, this is where they threw their pulverized dirt. Only because they knew you guys were coming 146 years later and needed a place to park. <laughs> That's my story. I'm seeing to it. <laughs> and this bucket right here, this was used in the high peak mine. When we get in the back of the high peak mine, there's 11 levels in this mountain. This level we're standing right now is level 6 in the back. And there's a shaft that goes down 425 feet. This is what they brought the ore up in. Now this also served as the elevator. You have one miner with one leg in and one leg out. Another miner on the other side about the same weight, one leg in and one leg out. And the hoist hopper dropped slowly down through the shaft and they dragged their feet up along the edge. That way the bucket wasn't hitting the jagged rocks. Now this wood structure right here, anytime you enter a mine, this is called an addit, A-D-I-T. So this being the Eagle Mine, we call this the Eagle Addit. And then we exit the back of the mountain, we'll exit through the high peak addit. Now I do have 10 different adits all up and around this mountain. If we went 200 feet right up this road between the big pine trees, there's another eagle at it right up there, and there's a whole other section of eagle mine that's detached from this side of the mountain. All right. In the 12-hour shift, they grab these off the hooks. These are called chits, C-H-I-T-S. They put in their pocket or pin it to the work gear, go work their 12 hours. Then at the end of the shift, the hoist hopper was one responsible. If he came up here and saw an empty hook, he knew he left the miner on one of the lower levels, and the other six to seven miners had to go find him for the go home for their day. Now, this mine operated from 1870 to 1934. They shut all the 200 gold mines down in 1934 because that was through the Great Depression and the government froze the gold market at $34.91 an ounce. And the way it's fluctuating with the economy, they're losing money. They're spending more on labor than getting profit back. So they shut all 200 mines down. Now, that's 64 years of operation. So we know in 64 years, technology got greater. So when I take you folks underground, I'm going to show you things from the 1870s as well as the 1930s. Starting with, this is the original hard hat right here. Everything was done by candlelight. The little sardine can here had a minute. They'd light the candle to reflect the light.
All right, right here I have a picture of Bill and Rance down outside his cabin down here in Banner. This is a typical monitor's cabin from the 1880s. Right below is his little lunch pill. Uh, Billy Moran was the one that discovered Eagle Mine on April 5th, 1870. He saw the rock quartz ledge protruding through the side of the mountain back where the that it was, and he started to tunnel from south to north, thinking this is the way the vein went. Well, 15 feet back from where I'm standing, it stopped. So he's like, darn it, I got a pocket like Mike Dillon Dubay's where his rest mine. But he already claimed 19 of the 27 acres that were on today. He said, well, it's not going to hurt to tunnel a little bit more. He got to this point right here, and it was discovered all the veins are going from west to east. So now this center tunnel with the tracks becomes what we call a cross-cut tunnel. Then they want to go parallel with the quartz vein because that's got the gold bearing on it. That's called a drift. And when the vein did end, they make sure scaffold making a five-foot diamond hole, tunneling all up to the surface let the air in, and that's called a stope. So this being eagle vein right here, we call this the eagle cross-cut. This is the eagle drift. It went 143 feet back that way. But you see, if I take my flashlight down, it's dark. Here's the rainwater, snow melting has washed the stove in, but there was an eagle stove back there. Now this wood shorn that we're gonna pass underneath, this is not original. This was put in in 1966 by their grandpa, so we could give tours. As you're walking underneath, you're gonna see two yellow beams. Between the two yellow beams going five feet up, and then 37 feet up the cross cut, it's called the Hayden Drift, the Hayden Vein. Any questions? Hiding. Uh, most of the veins are in the eagle from an inch and a half in width to 12 inches in width. Now down here in Banner, uh, Drew Bailey had a mine called the Ready Relief Mine. He had one that was 15 inches by 15 inches and went 158 feet long. He got a lot of gold out of it. Now you're going to see it's encased in blue. The blue is uh, called Julian Schist, S-C-H-I-S-T. <laughs> it's a rock plate formation, starts up in Ranchita. It's about 20 miles north of the it says the crow flies, comes south through Julian through the Cuyamaca Mountains, and ends up in Descanso near Area State 8. See, if I put my flashlight here, it's blue here. Everything we're standing in is Julian Schist. Now, we call this the star cross cut, and this is the way the vein went right down here, and as you pass by, this is the star drift. It went back about 162 feet, okay? No spiders down here. But there is a spider somewhere. I see one little now. The blue stuff has the gold in it. You know what happens when they turn on the fan? That's when the shift hits the fan. <laughs> Mine. We're gonna go here to the high peak mine. Some of us are already in the high peak mine. <laughs> now the reason these two mines are connected is the owner of the high peak mine, his name was Sebastian Southermer. When World War I broke out, the military desperately needed scrap iron, so he donated his stamps and pads from his rock crusher to the military to be melted down to make bombs. So after the war, he was that a rock crusher. Now the one I have out there, that is Billy Moran's from 1872, and he had it out on notes. It was not paid off. So Sebastian coordinated with Bill and said, hey, let's connect the two mines. Let me use your rock crusher and I'll give you some royalties for my gold to help pay for it. Because that rock crusher was $80,000 back in 1872. <laughs> wow. Now the Eagle Mine has one level with three drifts. You saw two because one's above the wood shoring. The high peak here has 11 levels. So when you guys step underneath this sign, we're on level six. There's five tunnels up above us, five down below. One's at the very top of the mountain, 11's down at the bottom. They're about 100 feet apart. Okay. How long did it take him to get from where we entered the, the mine to where you're standing right now? I'm going to cover that on the next station. Gotcha. <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right here are some early edition jackhammers. These particular ones are from uh, 1920 to 1934. The very first jackhammer ever invented was in 1897, and to this day it's called the Widowmaker. <laughs> and we have it up on the next level. Y'all get to see where you go home today. Now, from 1870 to 1897, before the jackhammers were invented, the miners did what's called a double jacking system. And that consisted of one miner holding up a four foot rod with a point, while the other one feeding it with a sledgehammer. Now, they didn't want to make a door, so they do like number five on the dice. They do two holes up here at the top, one here in the center, two down the bottom, all four foot in depth. They were getting four feet of tunnel per 12-hour shift, so eight feet of tunnel in a day. Wow. 
So then they clean it all out and they pack it. Now from 1870 to 1914, they packed it what's called a cartridge stick. It's about the size of my flashlight right here, but it was basically black powder rolled up in newspaper. Then in 1914 is when they came out with dynamite. So they cleaned all five holes out, packed them all in, ran five fuses, intertwined them, connected to one lead fuse, and this lead fuse was very important. What I have up on the next level are called jump holes. All the other miners went outside except the one light and fuse. He was called the powder man. And this lead fuse was 52 seconds per foot. So we'll say, for instance, if it was eight foot long, he had eight times 52 seconds to light that fuse, run down the tunnel, jump in the side jump hole, and then the blast shot up to him. It saved him from flying projectiles, but not from the dust. It gets crazy dusty in here. Now, they didn't have respirators back then, so what they did is they wet their bandanas down. That's what they wrapped around their nose and their mouth for limited protection. All right, as we go to pass around the corner here, we're going to be stepping on the original turntable. That's to change the direction of the ore carts. Behind that, you're going to see a gate. On the other side of the gate, it's another bucket like the one out front. Behind the bucket, you're going to see a wood primer. It's a six foot wide by six foot wide square box, and that's the shaft that goes down 425 feet to the bottom levels. If we do the math, it's 27 stories straight down. Wow. To give you guys an idea how deep that hole is, I measured from the front gate to the turntable right here. That's only 395 feet. So this hole's deeper than from the turntable back to that front gate. Now, if you go to my website by the end of next month, www.TheEagleMiningCult.com, I've got four Marines from Camp Pendleton that came out and bugged the heck out of me. They've got their waiver liability signed off, their carbon dull suits, their air tanks, their air masks, their carbon monoxide detectors, their little hard hats with the GoPro camera, and they're going to repel down these 27 stories, and we're going to do a little doc committee for you all and put it on our website. Nobody's been in that hole since 1934. All right. <laughs> Watch your step. Watch the video. I don't like to go though. Wow. That's the way Oh, hi. Oh, there's the shaft. <laughs> okay, this is where we hide. <laughs> Look at this thing. Aren't you, found, aren't you glad you found this on the website, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I have you guys just keep sliding a little bit over, please. Thank you. That way, get everybody in the room. Fired up. I've had my, my <laughs> brother's an electrician for a company called Neo Electric, and he's coming to cut the new one. I've never seen where you didn't have to shut the power off. He's got these new clips that just cut it right in. Really? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, but you or I try that? Oh, they'll bring the place down. Yeah. Arcing it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a gas-powered hoist engine built for the Eagle Mining Company in 1896, so it's been in here a little while. And they brought it in, disassembled, assembled it in here. Um, this is where the hoist stopper sit and operate. Right here is this brake and release handles. Around this pole would be a cable wrap trying to shut up right over there. And right over there is one of the four wood ledgers. Um, they had one resting in each corner of the square at the bottom, and they went up for like a TP up at the top. Then right behind this young lady on the workbench right here, this is the other pulley from 1896. And this pulley was hanging up in the air, probably about the center of the square of my flashlight right here. So the cable came off this pulley off the motor here, up over that pulley, and came down connected to the bucket. Now they had a bell over there with the rope going down 425 feet, and the hoist chopper has this bell right here, and that's how they communicated back and forth, because, you know, they didn't have Motorola. <laughs> And if you guys look at your cell phone right now, you guys have no service. <laughs> okay, we are at the halfway point here. We are 800 feet underground from the very tip of the mountain. Okay? Now, right here on the wall, I got the California shaft bell signals. I will go ahead and demonstrate the top one, and that's 2-1 bells, and that's to hoist the rock. So that's the bell over on the wood ledger with the rope going down. It's a miter down the hole, pulling the rope, telling the hoist operator the bucket's pulling needs to pull it up. And this is what he would hear. 2-1. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate them all. I hope you don't mind. 
Just if we hear seven repeatedly, we have to run. <laughs> it means there's an accident. But on that note, I'm the one ringing the bell, and I'm not taking the time to do it. So it's in your best interest. If you see me dart, you better be on my heels. <laughs> do I have any questions? Oh, wait, this was gas powered. This is exhaust. It's like a muffler right here. As you can see, the ceiling is black. There was fumes. Now, he only turned the machine on to bring the bucket up. Once he got high enough to where he dumped the car, he shut the motor off, go there, dump the bucket in the car, he could come back over here with the motor off, pull the release, this it on spool, and he could play with the brake to get it at the level they were at. Once he got it to that level, he had about a one hour window. He'd push the cart out, help the gentleman unload it, the rock crusher, and be back in here within the hour with the empty cart waiting to hear the bell. But yes, had he been in here for long duration or any of this, he would be dead from carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. But to make you guys feel safe, I have no recorded deaths on this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? All right, we're going to go do the toughest part of this tour right now. That's going up the stairs to level up five. Smith, who's the owner operator of the High Peak Mine from 1916 when it shut down in 1934. Now, I told you guys down in the Eagle, the stopes are for air. This Smith stope here served a dual purpose. So we're on level five. That one goes up to four to three to two all the top mountain level one. Now, as you can see on the ground here, we got ore car trash heading out this way. So this is the way out to the High Peak Mill site when he did have his rock crusher. Now, they had no hoist at the top of the mountain level one. So what to do is they go blast their top four levels, get their loose rock in a wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow is smithed up, and they just like a shoot. And they have a cart sitting here on the tracks waiting to accept it. Um, it was easier to do it internally than trying to go from one to two to three to four to five on the outside of the mountain with tracks. Okay, right here in the wall, I have the Powderman's tools. When they got their five holes bored out, they're going to make sure all the debris was out of there. That way, when they're shoving their cartridge secret dynamite, didn't create a spark and blow up in their face. So they take the air gun here and blow it out. Then they'd use the finishing touches here at the swab stick. Then they'd take the cartridge secret dynamite, depending on what year it was, push it in the tamp tie with the tamping bar. And like I said down below, they'd run their five fuse, intertwine them. And here's my lead fuse sign right here 52 seconds and one foot. And the powder man would light it and run like it, going, where's that jump hole? Okay, right here I have a map of the full mountain. As you can see the detail up in the top left corner, five stopes coming through here. Now when we're looking at this map, we're looking at it from two different angles. All right, everything over here to the left, this is all the Eagle Mine. When we're viewing that, we're standing up here on the peak looking straight down. Everything over here to the right is the High Peak Mine, and we're on the side of the mountain looking from a side view. So we came in right here through the Eagle at it. This is our first stop with the picture Bill and Moran. That's the Eagle Drift. That's the stope I told you the guys that washed in. This is the Hayden right here. That's above the yellow beams. That's one you guys didn't see. This is the star, and this is the star stope. It's still open today. Then we continued through the cross cut, and right about here is where we came into the high peak mine. Came down around the turntable in the hoist room. Then we came upstairs. We're standing here right now. As you can see, we will be going out the high peak drift out the high peak. <clears throat> but since he passed away at home, he's not considered a battalion in the mine. It's a little gray area there. <laughs> now, this happened in January of 1906. So, this is still when they're using candles. Because of the cave and the oxygen was limited, so they had to use their candles sparingly because the candlelight was burning the oxygen. Now, the reason I went in this little spiel is I'm going to sneak around the corner and we're going to shut the lights off on you for a few seconds <laughs> and show you how dark it gets. So, I'm going to have to ask you guys to shut your phones off. Getting tight down here. Wish I was shorter. This is the way to make it. Oh, I don't know. You're two, you're three, you're four, I can take two more, you're five. Going to see the Widowmaker. Yeah. 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 The miners that worked in here only lived about 20 years. 
temperature just went up about 10 degrees. about 60 degrees in the mine, but 85, 90 outside for sure. Dang. Hey, I made it without banging my head. Yay. Whew. Oh, there's the heat. All right, that's a tough day's work. Another casualty of the mine. I guess it's too hard to get it out of here. I just left it. <laughs> Eagle mining. This ain't a prop either. <laughs> this looks like the real deal. Look at that. I don't think I've got an axe in it. That's actually real. I'm gonna axe you again, man. <laughs> you know, this one's got a flat tire. I think we'll be taking the car home. I'm doing the hook right here and the space plate will pop open, but it's detaching it back here from the chassis. So this is like a little miniature dump truck. <laughs> if I push this lever over, this bucket will tip forward and the quartz lock will slide right out of here. Now you remember the picture I held up with the Z building and the lady in the dress? That was located right under the time we took a picture up the valley here. Over here behind these two trees, you might be able to see part of a white pipe come down the bank. This is where they dumped all the ore. After the shaft, they went down to level 11. Or maybe the and on level 6 and level 9 from this shaft, there's tunnels going underneath right here all the way back to the shaft where I rang the bell. Like I said, they're about 100 feet apart, uh, but from 9 to 10 to 11 or 50 feet apart. But they are smack dab on top of each other. If I was to take a laser point and hit the center of this attic right here, go all the way up the tree line right here, 350 feet up the mountain, there's a plateau, and level three added to the straight line. Which I've already got, the reason I've already been up there with the GoPro. Plate, which is immersed the gold into a ball, put it into a ceramic crucible, and send it over to his assayer on site. What I have over here in the museum is called a Mirka retort. Looks like a little moon sign, so you let the bunsen burn underneath it. Then he'll take the lid off, put the crucible in the retort, put the lid back on, and clamp it down tight. Then he'll heat it up to 932 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the mercury turns into a gas vapor. It'll come up through the lid into a tube, comes around hitting a cylindrical water cooling jacket, where it resolidifies into a liquid and then drops down into a glass beacon and it's recycled reusable mercury for the next day. Now you still have the gold in the crucible and the retort, but sometimes you do get other elements. Copper and silver does come hand in hand with gold. But the modern center Julian in the 1870s, they were only after the gold. So they pick the hottest melt point of the three elements, which is copper, and they'll heat that retort up to 1,981 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, all three elements are like a molten liquid. All right, so then they unclamp it, grab some tongs, pull the lid off, pull the crucible out, set it on the shelf, and he'll let it cool off and harden again. As it's going through this process, it separates itself in layers. Gold being the heaviest fall down the bottom, next will be silver, next will be copper. Come out looking like parfait, and everybody loves parfait. <laughs> so once it's all hard, he'll take it out of the crucible, knock off the elements he doesn't want, leave him what they call a gold button. Now when the asteroid gets three gold buttons, he'll put all three buttons in the retort a second time without the crucible, heats up to the gold mountain point, which is 1,945 degrees Fahrenheit, then he'll pour it into the stamp bar mold. And when the surface of that gold bar is just about ready to harden, he'll stamp the top by weight, claim, purity, and his asteroid's number. And that's the tedious process of getting it to a gold bar. Then they'll want to ship it to the bank in San Diego. They'll put it on the Wells Fargo stagecoach and eight miles out of town to get held up by Bandito. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> now, if you watch these movies where they're just chucking gold bars around, that's Hollywood, okay? That's so inaccurate. Gold is very heavy. If you had a bar about that size, about that thick, that'd be like going to Home Depot, grabbing a 90 pound sack of cement, how far you can chuck that down the aisle. <laughs> gold is twice as dense as lead. Wow. Any questions? I got a little treat for y'all. My older brother came up two weeks ago, and we just got our one stamp mill fired off. So to give you guys an idea, this is a one stamp with one piston. It's a smaller stamp than the California Five. At one time in 1876, through the 200 gold mines here, there was 75 of these five stamp mills 
going up through the belly 24 hours a day. So this is just one stamp. This is how loud it is, all right? You guys ready? <laughs> so Brian, you can lift one of those up over here and get a free beer. <laughs> no. He's already going to help keep gold inside your pan. Now as I was saying up there, gold is very heavy as this up. So if you want to get some gold, you want to scrape along the bottom, make that plastic on metal. I'm just going to scrape down there and I'm going to leave my pan on the water and shake it. What I'm doing is I'm loosening up the sand, but I'm vibrating my heavy gold flakes down the bottom of the pan. And I just go like this in the counterclockwise. I'm letting the water in, the sand flow out, and I'm going right over those ridges there. Now I like to keep my pan one third underwater in a 45 degree angle because you're allowing fluidly the water in sand out. You just gotta work it. This is the hardest part right here. It's called patience. You gotta have a little patience. This is fresh sand or you've been working it all along. Okay. <laughs> Get down to there and I'll sure you go. Here we go. Here we go. There you go. Yeah, if you got enough of this where you can press it the size of a sugar cube, that'd weigh about an ounce, which would be 1350 bucks on the market today. Now, a simple field test the miners did to see it was real gold or full gold is you shade it. See, when I shade it, it says it's a natural gold color, that tells me that's real gold. Where fool's gold, which is called iron pyrite, it's like a mirror, it reflects the sunlight. So if you shade it, it will disappear. That's how you know if you got fool's gold or real gold. All right? That one was just a second. Well, that's Craig, you want me to get you gold, don't you? I want my gold. I don't think you get to keep the gold, though. See, at Knott's Berry Farm, they used to put the gold in a little bottle for you. Let you take it home. All right, we're leaving the old mining town. And uh, my son got something today. What did you get, son? Uh, pure gold, I guess. Hold it. Hold it up for the people to see. How much did you pay for that? Ten bucks. Ten bucks? Is it, what, is it uh, pure gold? Pure gold. Wow. What do you think of that? I like it. My oh, baby. <laughs> Sweet, huh? Did you have fun? Yeah. All right. Very fun. All right. Do it again next time. And yeah, next time we'll get some silver. Uh, okay. So basically that's worth less than $10? No, no. It's just it's gold, but it's um, it's, it's a foil like a mill thick or something. Sure. That's cool, man.